these two tissues then interface with the uh, bone proximally and distally, the two vertebral bodies, through the cartilage end plate. And although it's composed of the same similar molecules as the nucleus pulposus, type 2 collagens and proteoglycans, a lot of water, the organization of those molecules is entirely different. So these are three tissues, very different. But they're all integrated and work as one tissue. And their complexity is increased by these graded interfaces. So a unique tissue. Unfortunately, it's very prone to undergo degeneration. And the degeneration often occurs focally and most commonly in the central nucleus pulposus tissue, characterized by a loss of extracellular matrix. And as you can imagine, this tissue, which is functionally a weight-bearing tissue, once you change the composition of that nucleus pulposus, you're going to alter the distribution of the forces across the disc. And that promotes degeneration that progresses through, involves the, nu the nucleus, the annulus, the cartilage end plate, and the bone. And you can see here in this appearance, this is a normal intervertebral disc, obviously pathological degenerate. And you can appreciate the histologic histological features of a normal disc versus a degenerate disc, which is collapsed and no longer functioning properly. This, um, this de degeneration can be associated with back pain or neck pain. And this disease process is extremely common. Approximately 80% of individuals have disc degeneration over the age of 60. And so when you develop back pain, for example, uh, you utilize the healthcare system. And it's been uh, reported that um, back pain, neck pain, costs the healthcare system in the US alone $110 billion. So that is just a, a small a snapshot, and you can imagine what the healthcare costs is for back pain across the world. It is actually a very common entity, and I suspect that there are many in this room have, or their family members who have suffered from uh, that um, disease process. And it is actually quite debilitating. So what treatments do we have currently for, the, for this uh, disease process? Like any musculoskeletal um, disease, we have two standard approaches, exercise, and something to stop the pain. And when that fails, um, your option then becomes surgical intervention. And I've uh, just shown images or borrowed images from a number of different ways we can treat these surgically. So the simplest way is just to excise the tissue that's causing problems, um, which is one approach. But if it's a little bit more extensive, their intervention tends to be what we call fusion. And in that situation, the surgeon removes part of the disc and creates a, an environment that in, uh, induces ossification. So you completely calcify the disc. So you can imagine you calcify the disc, that's gonna limit um, motion and your functionality in that area. Additionally, it doesn't always work. And there have been attempts to enhance the success rate by adding in growth factors to that process. And as you can see, that approach landed in the Wall Street Journal because of its um, side effects. So neither of these uh, treatments restore disc height or functionality completely, which of course is very important uh, to allow you to do the things that you want to do pain-free. So the other approach that has been developed is to excise the disc and replace it with a synthetic prosthesis. Well, we know a lot about um, these types of prosthesis in the big joints, hips and knees. And there we know that these implants fail and they create wear debris, which I'm sure you all know about. The difference here is that it's very close to the big vessels, aorta, inferior vena cava, and your spinal cord. So problems uh, attributed to those 
complications in that location really could be devastating for the individual. So as you can imagine, there has been a great deal of interest in trying to develop alternative ways to um, treat a degenerate disc. And there's really been a lot of interest in biological therapies. And it really makes sense because you're gonna develop a functional tissue, no synthetic agents or very limited synthetic agents that can respond to load and remodel as you need it. So um, that has really been the thrust of much of the research um, in this area in the past uh, number of years. And we can actually broadly characterize the approaches that have been taken into three different categories really based on the extent of the disease. And that's sum, uh, summarized pictorially here in this uh, slide. So early on in the disease, when you've just lost a bit of extracellular matrix, it would make sense to perhaps treat the disease with uh, an agent that would stimulate the residual cells to uh, make that matrix and reconstitute the tissue. But as the disease progresses and there's more extensive changes, loss of cells, no matter what you do to stimulate what remains, it can't, it, it can't repair itself. And in that situation, groups have been looking at trying to inject cells back into the tissue and perhaps I, I stimulate those cells to produce the matrix and repopulate and regenerate the tissue. But as we progress along that continuum, there is progressive uh, changes and degradation in all the tissues of the disc, the nucleus pulposus, the annulus fibrosus, the cartilage end plate, and even the bone adjacent to it in the vertebral bodies. And so there you can imagine that none of those approaches are gonna be efficacious and your best bet is gonna to be to size that disc and replace it with a biological disc. That's where our group comes in. That's an area that we're very much interested in. And you're probably sitting there thinking, is she crazy? There are so many different tissues there to repair. How is she ever gonna do that? Well, the first thing we did, um, uh, sorry, so, um, I, I apologize. So um, before I get to that, I just wanted to summarize some of the uh, approaches that um, are being taken uh, from these different uh, uh, approaches. So if you are going to actually repair um, the disc with a um, molecular approach, people have been using growth factors, link uh, protein, uh, platelet-rich factors, uh, sorry, platelet-rich plasma, which they're injecting into the intervertebral disc. People have been using gene therapy. But these are all in vitro and in animal models. There have been groups um, actually doing clinical trials uh, with cells, injecting cells into the intervertebral disc. And when I went onto the website clinicaltrials.gov, I found at least 36 clinical trials that are ongoing, many of which are recruiting patients. And there have actually been a number of papers published um, describing the results of, um, I, I, would, I would say, just pilot studies. But most of them don't have uh, a control group, except for this one paper that was published by Noriega and their group um, recently. And this was a group of 25 patients in which they injected mesenchymal stem cells into the disc. And they followed up these patients uh, for one year. And they were able to show that these patients uh, had decreased pain and uh, increased um, repair of their disc or increased disc height. But this was a small study, uh, one year follow up. Um, there's obviously a lot of work to do. The interesting thing um, about all of this is that there is evidence that intradiscal injections may be a problem. So uh, recent uh, studies have suggested that um, you can create actually a degeneration in animals by um, puncturing the disc. So that's a problem. And a recent study by ISSI and their group, they were able to show that a very small needle, and I'm talking about 
30 gauge, which is really, really tiny, if you scan the discs by MR, you can already see alterations in the mechanics of the, um, or the signal of that, that um, disc that's been punctured. So even minor perturbations um, are problematic for the disc. Um, and there's a, there has been two clinical trials, um, the most recent one published by Kuehler um, and Karaji, in which they looked at a matched cohort of patients that received intradiscal injections for discography. And discography is when you inject a dye into the disc to see if you can induce the pain to demonstrate whether those individuals need surgical therapy. And they followed this matched cohort for 10 years and was able to show that these individuals had an increased uh, frequency of undergoing um, progressive disc degeneration requiring surgery. So until we develop alternative methods to, to deliver these um, molecules or um, uh, cells, disc injections may not be the optimal way. And that's where the um, concept of uh, replacing the disc with uh, tissue engineered biological disc replacement uh, came into to being. Um, and uh, as I was saying, it is um, a very daunting task. And so one of the first things that we did was go to the literature to see if there was actually any evidence to support this approach. And there was, uh, surprisingly. Uh, uh, people have actually had this idea uh, many years before we even thought of it. Um, I guess uh, it's really very few really new ideas. And uh, uh, a number of animal studies showing that disc replacements uh, work in small animals. And then there was a recent study, uh, well, sorry, a, a human study that was published in 2007, five patients in which they um, had disc degeneration symptomatic and they excised the disc and replaced it with an allogeneic um, disc from another patient. And this was obviously a, ca a cadaver. And they were able to show that um, these patients responded to this treatment and that there was no immune response. So it seems that um, bioengineering a disc may be uh, an approach that will be suitable to treat individuals with uh, um, back pain and neck pain. So three different tissues, bone, a lot of um, tissues to try and reconstruct. So we thought that the best way to approach this was to generate each tissue individually and then combine them all together. They're just so different that the requirements to generate any one of those were likely to be very different than the other. So the first thing we did was um, work on developing a bone substitute. The bone is involved in disc degeneration and it needs to be replaced. It seemed to us it was necessary to support the tissue and would be great to help fix the, the uh, disc tissue when we implanted it. So our first challenge was to make a bone substitute. Together with uh, my colleagues, Bob Pellier and Mark Grimpus, we developed this um, bone substitute, which is a calcium polyphosphate made from calcium and phosphates, which are the normal uh, molecules that make up the mineral of bone. And as you can see, it's a porous material with um, strength that matches bone. And when you implant it into bone, the bone grows into the porous material, which is, um, you can see here, the porous material is this refractile white um, structure and the bone is black and you can see the bone growing in, no reaction. Appears that the uh, body accepts this uh, very readily. And this is material is completely biodegradable. So over time, it will disappear. So we had our biomaterial. We then decided to um, work on developing the nucleus pulposus cartilage end plate biomaterial construct as our next uh, goal. Oh, sorry. And the way we did that 
was um, a two-step process in which we isolated cartilage, isolated the cells from the cartilage, and plated them on this uh, bone substitute material, as you can see here. And then we would grow it in culture, and it would form this tissue integrated to this bone substitute. We then went ahead and isolated nucleus pulposa cells and plated those cells on top of the cartilage. And as you can see here, this is the top of the cartilage by scanning electron microscopy. And when the cells are seated on top, um, they attach to the cartilage very readily. And you can see them clearly here. And if you grow it over time, you can develop what we call this triphasic construct. You can see the nucleus pulposus tissue integrated to the underlying cartilage, which is then integrated to the bone substitute. All of the tissues are, were characterized and shown to be of proper composition. And they were integrated, which is very important for functionality. So we had this um, component. We then asked ourselves, because we're tissue engineers, we always want to sim simplify. Could we get away without um, uh, generating this tissue without the cartilage layer? It would be much simpler, much faster, um, and it would be easier to make, of course. So we did this experiment to answer this question. And instead of seeding the cells on top of each other, we kept them separate. So we isolated the chondrocytes, seeded them on the bone substitute, isolated the nucleus cells, seeded them on the bone substitute material, and we combined them in co-culture, but it, they didn't contact each other. And what we found was that the nucleus pulposus tissue that formed in the presence of the cartilage was much more abundant, thicker, and much more robust than the tissue that was generated in the absence of cartilage, as you can see in this histological section. And again, we characterized this and quantified it and demonstrated that there was significant differences. What I would like to draw your attention to is that we wondered if the differences in the amount of tissue was related to the cellularity. Was it that the, the um, nucleus pulposus tissue grown in the presence of cartilage actually just proliferated better and had more cells, and that's why there was more matrix. So when we measured the DNA content of those two tissues, you can see that in the presence of cartilage or in the absence of cartilage, there was really no difference in the cellularity over time. So it was truly um, an effect of the, um, co the cartilage itself on the nucleus pulposa cells and stimulating them to, in some way, accumulate more matrix and make a better tissue. Well, that was intriguing to us. So we did another experiment um, to start to investigate this in a little bit more detail. So the first question we asked ourselves, is this just a culture artifact? We've got two growing tissues. Maybe it's you know just we've created a situation. Um, Will that really happen if we had well-formed uh, end, end plate cartilage? So instead of our in vitro formed cartilage, our co-culture system was actually the nucleus pulposa cells on their bone substitute, but co-cultured with the actual end plate from the uh, intervertebral disc. And what you can see here in this data is that, again, the um, nucleus pulposus tissue in the presence of this cartilage tissue actually accumulated more matrix. And similar to the um, previous experiment, there was no significant difference in the cellularity. So clearly the cartilage was having an effect on this tissue formation. Well, we asked one more question. What was the mechanism? And there had been a um, paper a long time back showing that TNF-alpha, which we know stimulates a degradative response, was actually detected in discs in um, infants, two-year-olds, as early as two years. So we wondered 
if there was some effect on TNF-alpha that was going on that may be contributing to this uh, tissue formation. And sure enough, we were very fortunate. That was really a really focused experiment that worked out wonderfully. And what we found is that when the chondrocytes were grown in the presence, uh, sorry, the nucleus pulposus cells were grown in the presence of chondrocytes, the nucleus pulposus cells expressed much lower levels of TNF-alpha than the nucleus pulposus cells grown alone. And this translated to differences in the amount of protein. So the chondrocytes were producing a factor that was inhibiting in some way the production of TNF-alpha by nucleus pulposus cells, and that's why we were ending up with better tissue. The end result, of course, is that we need to include the cartilage end plate in our constructs, and so that is a step we can't uh, uh, avoid. So we had our um, composite, nucleus pulposus, cartilage end plate, bone substitute, and then we turned our attention to the annulus fibrosus. We left that one to the end because that is really a complex tissue. I, I um, described it very briefly as an angle ply multilamellate, and that's what it is. But this is a, a lamellate that has uh, an orientation of alternating angles. So the um, uh, lamellae um, are at 65 degrees angle from the vertical, and they alternate their direction. And you can imagine if you load your disc, this will allow the annulus to accommodate the compressive forces. Very complex tissue. So we needed to figure out a way to get the cells to make this tissue, and we decided that cells are really smart. This is really complicated, pretty hard to do in vitro. We were going to give it some help. And that's when I uh, teamed up with Paul Santerre, who's a chemical engineer, and he was able to generate a scaffold which was an aligned scaffold, and it was made from polyurethane carbonate, and he would electrospin it, which allowed us to generate a very aligned, structured uh, scaffold. And this is its appearance, and when we look at it under scanning electron microscopy, you can see that the fibers are aligned, as we would hope, and that these fibers actually see, look quite similar in size to the appearance of the collagen fibers of the annulus fibrosus. So we were very pleased with this. Additionally, this material is biodegradable, so we could use it to make our tissue, and over time it would disappear, which is really what we want. And it also had a strength that was similar to the strength of a single lamellae of the annulus fibrosus. So it really had a lot of features that suggested that this would be the right scaffold for our goal. So, complex tissue, how are we gonna get cells to grow on this scaffold and do all the right things? So we thought that we better go back and use developmental biology to help us figure out this complex problem. The cells in the body figure out how to align themselves and make this tissue, and we were hoping that it would give us some clues about what we might need to do. So we looked at annulus fibrosis in fetuses as it developed and in an adult, and what we saw is very early on that the cells were aligned. They're uh, oriented, uh, elongated, and aligned parallel, parallel to the direction of the um, lamellae. And you can see here that the cells are producing a small mass of collagen, but that happens very early on. And polarized light microscopy is a cheap way to um, uh, demonstrate collagen because of its structure, and it's this sort of refractile white stuff that you're seeing here. So cells are aligned, start to make collagen pretty quickly. And as you can see, as the um, fetus develops, this just gets more pronounced because of the production of increasing amounts of collagen. And this is appreciated in the polarized light microscopy, where again you can see the lamellae oriented here, aligned, and the collagen is aligned 
parallel to that orientation. And again, that's the white stuff that you're seeing here. Interestingly, with age, there's no further changes except that more collagen is accumulated and those individual lamellae become much, much thicker. So all this information is in that early stage in that first trimester. So that suggested to us that right from the get-go, we needed to develop um, conditions that would allow the cells to do the right thing. But what was the right thing? Fortunately, we found a paper uh, from Anthony Hayes, who had studied the development of the annulus fibrosus in, in rats um, as it developed. And what he was able to show is that the cells very early on developed that cross-ply uh, arrangement. And that arrangement is promoted by the integrin alpha-5 beta-1. And you can see that here in this image. And the, so the cells align in that cross ply, and then they start to elongate, which you can see here. As a, you can see an individual stain cell, which has been stained with actin, which is green, and you can appreciate that the cells are elongated and aligning. And then these cells go on to make these fibronectin fibrils, which is again green in this image. And then the cells produce collagen that's oriented. And that seems to be the process of getting the cells to do the right thing. So that was our goal. We took our polyurethane carbonates and decided that we would coat them with different molecules to see what would happen to the cells. And as you can see in this graph, we coated it with uh, collagen type 1, a mixture of collagen type 1 and fibronectin, fibronectin, vitronectin. And these are just very standard um, it, molecules that one uses to promote adhesion. And what we saw very quickly was that fibronectin enhanced adhesion. So that spoke to us as being a, an important molecule to uh, promote uh, cell attachment. We then looked at what happened to these cells on these coated scaffolds. And this is just um, a series of scanning electron micrographs uh, sh uh, showing you the cells on these scaffolds. And it's hard to see the scaffolds even at this um, period, which is 24 hours, because the cells are there. But I'm hoping you can appreciate that in the scaffold that was coated with fibronectin, the cells are elongated. And that's what we wanted. We wanted elongated cells. That's what Anthony Hayes showed during development. That's what we saw in the human fetal annulus fibrosis. In contrast, the scaffolds that were coated with collagen, for example, the cells were round or they were more polygonal shape. So we focused in on the fibronectin coated scaffolds. The next question we asked, are these cells attaching through the integrin that we know is involved in this orientation? And sure enough, when we did uh, confocal imaging of our uh, scaffolds that had been stained with antibody reactive with alpha-5 beta-1 or alpha-V beta-3, and these are uh, just another control integrin um, for us, what we could see on the fibronectin scaffolds, these cells um, produced a lot of alpha-5 beta-1 integrin. And the alpha-5 beta-1 integrin is the green staining dots that you're seeing here. And when it was collagen coated, there were a couple of green dots, but really the cells produced much more alpha-V beta-3 integrin, which was the wrong type of integrin, and may explain why these cells have a different shape depending on how we coat the scaffolds. So our scaffolds um, produced uh, cells that were elongated. We're making the right kind of integrins. So the next question we asked is, are these cells now going to go ahead and make that fibronectin fibrils that we saw during the developmental stage? 
And so we stained our cells with antibody reactive with fibronectin, and we imaged it by confocal. And this is the cells on collagen-coated scaffold, and this is the cells on fibronectin-coated scaffolds. And I know your eye is drawn to these fibrils. And sure enough, these cells on the fibronectin-coated scaffolds were forming these fibronectin fibrils, something that we really didn't see um, in the collagen-coated uh, scaffold, uh, the cells growing on those scaffolds. So this organization promoted uh, the formation of these fibronectin scaffolds. And just to demonstrate to you that it isn't an artifact, because these are scaffolds that are co uh, coated with fibronectin, would we see it, these um, uh, fibrils, if there were no cells there? And so when we stained the same scaffolds uh, with the antibody, you can appreciate they're entirely negative. So it's not an artifact of the fibronectin coating. Well, we had to ask the next question. What happens to collagen? So, again, we have our uh, scaffolds, cells, um, and these are uh, scaffolds that were coated with fibronectin or coated with collagen. We stain the uh, cells with antibody reactive with type 1 collagen, which is the major component. And we um, uh, then imaged it by confocal microscopy. And we were able to show that over time, so this is a six hour image, and you can see the green staining, which is the type 1 collagen. And over time, you can see that the cells produce collagen that is forming these fibrils and is aligned parallel to the cells. In contrast, you don't see that in cells on the type 1 collagen-coated uh, scaffolds. So clearly, we had, uh, we'd hit the right scaffold and the right conditions. So we knew that the cells were doing the right thing. We went ahead to uh, try and make our multilamellated tissue. And this is a project done by Jonathan Ayu, who just uh, defended his PhD. Uh, and he uh, spent his PhD uh, developing this method to make this multilamellated tissue. And in this image, you can see that the final uh, construct, he's loaded this um, scaffold uh, and wrapped it around a Teflon tube to give him multiple layers. And he, grew, he seeded and grew these scaffolds in the spinner bioreactor, which you can see here. And at higher magnification, you can see the scaffolds here. And he grew them for three weeks and formed this tissue, which at higher power, you can see here, you can see the multiple layers of the scaffolds. And these are the white um, structures that you see here. And you can see this tissue that is forming um, on, on these scaffolds. And actually, the cells are starting to infiltrate into the scaffolds as it degrades. And when we stain the, um, these tissues for type 1 collagen, as you can see here, the green staining, these cells are producing lots of type 1 collagen. So they're doing the right thing. They're not synthesizing type 2 collagen are very much in the way of agrican, and these are molecules that are not really present in great amounts, um, in particularly the outer annulus. So the cells um, can form a multilamellated uh, tissue. So we have our nucleus, we have our cartilage end plate, we have our annulus. We have to combine them now to be able to make a uh, model of an intervertebral disc. So that was our next challenge. And this is um, the work of uh, uh, Suchu Lee, who um, is in the lab as well. And she took on this challenge. And essentially, what we did was we took our construct, our triphasic construct, we took our annulus fibrosus, and we combined them together. And uh, this is just a uh, schematic to show you um, what she did. 
um, the combination of the two. And surprisingly, they um, stuck together right away. And uh, we grew it for uh, three weeks and she harvested them. And this is just what it looks like after three weeks of culture. This is the uh, construct on the side. This is the construct looking down and you can see the nucleus and the annulus around it. And this is just a histological section of the cross uh, section of the um, construct, our model of an intervertebral disc. And this is it at higher magnification. And what you can see here is the nucleus pulposus and the annulus fibrosus, and they appear integrated. Cells are alive and um, uh, forming, uh, continuing to form tissue. We went on to characterize the tissue to ensure that they were maintaining the phenotype. And I won't go into details, um, but really just to show you that the nucleus pulposus was rich in agrican and type two collagen. And the annulus fibrosus was rich in type one collagen, which in this image is red. And this is just the uh, type one collagen alone. You can see that there's lots of type one collagen in the annulus fibrosus tissue. What we were missing is the um, transition between the nucleus and the annulus, which is the inner annulus fibrosus. And that is something that we'll have to deal with later. But we were very pleased that we were able to develop what we call a model of the intervertebral disc. We characterize the composition um, and content of these matrix molecules to see how it compares to the native disc. And not surprisingly, the um, content of proteoglycans and collagens of the tissues were actually a, fa a fraction of the native tissue. We only grew it for three weeks. There was no weight bearing. Um, very typical of tissue engineered tissues. As you can see here, this is the um, GAG content of uh, our engineered nucleus pulposus, which is really just um, about a third of the, um, uh, sorry, about a third of the native uh, nucleus and the collagen content similarly. So a little bit weaker uh, in terms of its um, composition. We, went, we also characterized um, the strength of some of these interfaces. I can tell you that histologically, it was integrated and that it was, we could easily handle it, but I had to prove that there was actually strength to that integration. And so the first thing we did was a push out test. And that essentially uh, consists of pushing this tissue out um, and away from the annulus fibrosus. And this will um, give us a reading of the strength of the integration between the nucleus and the annulus. And as you can see that over time, it increases, but again, it's only a fraction of the native um, intervertebral disc. But there is integration that has some strength. Next thing we did was look at the integration of those lamellae of the annulus fibrosus. And to do that, we did a peel test, which as you can imagine, is exactly what the, its name is. We took the two layers of the annulus and pulled them apart and measured the strength of that uh, interaction. And this is just what it looks like um, when we do the test. And you can see the two ends being pulled apart. And the uh, force displacement um, graphs are actually quite similar. Of course, the difference is in the y-axis, which is a different magnitude. But nevertheless, the shape is similar. And there is uh, a measurable strength between the lamellae. Again, um, uh, an order of magnitude less than the native annulus fibrosus. But again, there's adhesion. So we were very pleased with this uh, model that we had developed that had some mechanical properties and strengths. And we decided that we would implant it to see what would happen, just to get a clue as to whether we were truly on the right track. So our whole system was using bovine cells, so we decided to implant it into the tail of the cow, which I suspect you're wondering about the mechanical forces that that might experience. 
Well, it turns out that the tail of the cow experiences forces similar to what we can experience in our spines. So it's a good model. And what we did was we made a flap in the annulus fibrosus, carved out the nucleus pulposus and the inner annulus fibrosus. And in that defect, we implanted our construct and uh, put the annulus back around it and sewed it back into place. And then we harvested our implant one month later. And this is our implant in the tail of the uh, cow. And you can see the bone substitute material here, which is probably better seen on the uh, x-ray here. And what we figured out pretty quickly is that our method of fixation was not optimal. And so unfortunately, our implants subsided um, and in a sense failed because of that. But we got a lot of information, nevertheless, about what happened to that soft tissue that we had implanted. So we do have to work on fixation and that's something else that we will do. But this is the histological appearance of the tissue that we had implanted. And we are just focusing in on this aspect of it. And what you can see here is our implant right here. That's, and this is the native annulus fibrosus. You can see the bone substitute, what remains of the nucleus pulposus, and our annulus fibrosus. And I think you can appreciate that there's some integration between the two. And what was really um, great to see is that the annulus was still attached to the bone substitute and that the um, lamellae of that annulus tissue that we had generated in vitro and the strength of that interfaces between the layers was about 20 fold less at the time we implanted it, still remained adherent. And so this tissue has the potential to survive in vivo once it's implanted. So we learned a lot about our constructs, although in some ways the experiment failed. The other thing that was of interest to us is that this is uh, an allogeneic um, implant. So it's, it would be my cells to uh, uh, Yeni's um, spine, um, and yet there was no uh, immunological reaction, which is very encouraging and could make the process a whole lot simpler. So we went on to do our final um, set of experiments um, because now we were really, um, not our final set of experiments, but our final, we started to be, address some of our um, final problems because it looked like our construct was actually uh, going to work. We needed to work on that integration between the tissues and the uh, bone substitute material. And uh, again, uh, an interesting problem and we went back to our developmental biology and when we looked closely at how the annulus interacts with the cartilage and lagin which will make the vertebral body we saw interestingly that the annulus lamellae merge directly into the cartilage and what was interesting when we stained for collagen type one, which is the major component of the annulus, you can see here the annulus tissue going directly into the uh, cartilage tissue of the onlog and that's going to make the um, vertebral body. And this red staining is the collagen type two of the cartilage. And here the red staining is the aggregate. And again, it's just entering into that cartilage tissue directly. Very intriguing. So we try to mimic that type of organization as well to see if we could create a model that would allow us to study that interaction to try and identify the um, criteria or conditions that we would have to establish to be able to promote that integration. And I don't have a lot to talk about because this is uh, really just hot off the press. But um, 
we have very encouraging results that suggest that we may be able to develop this model uh, that will provide us with the information to facilitate that type of integration as well. And it was actually very simple. The uh, trick was to orient um, the annulus scaffold in such a way to mimic the insertion of the annulus fibrosis that we saw in that fetal tissue. And we, once we figured that out, we were able to generate our scaffolds and we made our annulus fibrosis tissue, we made our cartilage tissue, and we combined the two. And you can see that here. Here's our annulus tissue and it's sitting on a layer of cartilage. And when we cut through this tissue, as you can see here, so here's our annulus, here's our cartilage, we got a interface that seemed to mimic, very superficially I would agree, what occurs in the developing annulus fibrosis. And you can see the scaffold here, and this here and here, and this is our cartilage layer, and our annulus scaffold and the annulus fibrosis cells and tissue are seen here, and I think you can appreciate that there is integration of those two. And uh, when we stained for the, uh, the composition of the annulus fibrosis or for type 1 collagen, you can see here that this is entering into the um, cartilage tissue in a way that was very similar to what we saw in the developing um, annulus fibrosis cartilage end plate um, interface. So we've obviously got a lot more work to do, but it seems to us that we have now got all the different components and ways of studying those different components to try and optimize them to be able to go from this model of an intervertebral disc to this biological disc replacement. So we can bioengineer our model of um, the disc with integrated interfaces. And we have a model now of an annulus fibrosis that interfaces with cartilage as well. So we are going to be able to tackle the challenge of uh, integration of an entire disc into the vertebral body, uh, superior and inferior to it. And we are looking forward to that challenge. But there are clearly lots of challenges uh, ahead of us. Even just trying to decide what the right approach for this uh, treatment of back pain, trying to identify the cell source for all of these tissues going forward, and even patient selection, which is the right patients that uh, should undergo these different treatments. So it's a very exciting time. Um, and uh, we are very much looking forward to addressing all of these um, issues ahead of us. So I am the voice of um, very many people uh, who I am um, showing images and, and names of um, here. And I just want to acknowledge their contributions because without them and the funding sources, none of this would have happened. So thank you very much. And I am glad to take any questions. I have a, a question for the, um, is it possible to uh, really use uh, your, your system to be able to uh, study the effect of uh, mechanotransduction on the, on the system that you are using? Like, so because it is like, it, the, this intervertebral disc is like a weight, uh, there's a load all the time. Do you think that it is also, it can be used in bio, biomechanical experiments to see what is the effect of the load on the DNA or on the you know, matrix production? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and um, it will also be um, a way perhaps to strengthen the tissue uh, and make it stronger. So it may even be better once we implant it. So it will actually um, be a great model to be able to study those kinds of things. 
<clears throat> nice talk. Um, my question has to do with uh, once implanted, how long do you think its shelf life, so to speak, would be? So in other words, are there any predictions or challenges that you might see? Yeah, and uh, I, I did kind of simplify it. You're absolutely right. Um, we're putting it into an environment where there's degeneration and there are all sorts of inflammatory agent, agents circulating around. Um, so this, so we can't predict the lifespan, honestly, um, but perhaps by replacing it with something that is intact and normal, we'll be able to diminish that inflammatory process or perhaps develop a scaffold that can uh, produce or release factors that can dampen down the inflammatory process. So that will be the ultimate challenges that we'll have to investigate um, going forward as well. You're absolutely right. And uh, along the same venue, so <clears throat> once you implant it, um, what kind of tools do you think should be developed to see how well it's performing or how, how, how um, intact the structure is? So would it be imaging tools? Like, do you foresee some kind of technology that could be used just to assess, you know, how it's functioning? Or absolutely, it's absolutely. There, there are so many different things that I think ultimately would have to be developed um, to be able to actually even implant it tools um, to make sure it's properly placed and, and then to follow it and also to assess individuals and what they can do. Um, so imaging very much will be a uh, part of that, I suspect. Uh, thanks for your talk. Maybe a quick question. You mentioned that um, the um, the yield stresses, et cetera, were very low um, with no mechanical stimulation. Do you think that mechanically stimulating these implants as you're growing them might help to strengthen the uh, resulting tissue? Actually, I do think very much so that it will uh, end up strengthening it. We, we've done similar kinds of experiments because we also work in the area of cartilage repair, and we were able to show very clearly that uh, if we applied mechanical load to the cartilage that we were developing that we got much more much stronger cartilage which could withstand greater compressive force but what, what was also interesting was in that situation when we implanted the cartilage into the joint to resurface the joint the tissue actually got stronger over time so the loading in vivo will also have that effect. And what we don't know, and we don't know that for cartilage, we don't know it for disc, is actually what's the minimal amount of strength we need that will withstand that initial loading that will then stimulate it to get even stronger. Uh, and that's why we were so pleased to see that the annulus was intact because it was really 20-fold less strong than the native annulus. And so we thought the whole thing was just going to fall apart, but it stayed all together. So there's a lot to be uh, learned from all of this, for sure. Um, a lot to learn about the biology of the disc and um, the properties of the disc. Thank you very much. Thank you. And good for a is the token um, of our appreciation from Ryerson and San Marcos. Thank you so much for the